Hi, this is Paul Neal from Pen Productions, and I'm going to show you how to do Reaction Manager style connections in 3D Studio Max without using Reaction Manager. So we're just going to start in the top viewport, and uh, I'll use uh, two objects just as a, um, you know, to represent what we're going to be working with. And so we now have uh, our blue uh, blue sphere, which is going to be our, our driver, basically. When this moves up and down in Z, our box is going to move up and down. And we're going to be able to set how the box reacts to the Z movement, as opposed to just a direct connection via param wires, for instance. Reaction Manager has the uh, advantage over just a param wire or a deck a direct controller uh, instance is that it can actually use a function curve to be able to take the value uh, input and multiply it into a function curve and, and have it uh, react differently. So we're going to set that up without Reaction Manager. So first I'm just going to uh, just go and for instance put uh, some animation on here and uh, we'll just move it up and down let's say over the, the timeline. And um, on the uh, box now, we're going to uh, grab the uh, input here. We're just going to go and say uh, that the controllers. So I'm going to go grab the controller here for our box. And on the Z position up and down, uh, I'm going to say assign controller. And uh, we're going to use a float script. So with the float script assign, we're going to have two uh, values here. I'm going to have input. the input and I'm going to have curve as two uh, value types that we're going to work with and so the input uh, curve is actually going to be our spheres uh, value as it goes uh, up and down here and uh, so let's go and assign the controller and I'm going to go in and find just the controller and we could say it's going to be the spheres Z so we could uh, directly connect the box up by saying um, input dot value and spell it correctly there we go input dot value say create and now we're gonna have our box move up and down with our sphere so we want to be able to control that with a curve so our curve value is going to be a little bit different I'm going to go to global tracks I'm just going to do it though however uh, just through the curve editor and so in the curve editor, you need to probably show your global tracks going into the um, view filters. Make sure you're showing global tracks. And in the global tracks, under the uh, float value, under available, I'm going to assign a controller. And this is just going to be a Bezier float controller. And so there's the Bezier float controller that's uh, been assigned. And we're going to set a couple of keys on this. And we're essentially going to animate this track uh, changing over time. So I'm just going to say add keys. I'm going to drop a key at the beginning and end for sake of argument. It doesn't really need to be. Just go back to move. And I want to change the value up and, and say push it up like that. Now what we're going to do as well is I'm just going to change the tangents on here so that they're curved. This way we can really see what's going on. So what we can do is we can use this curve as an input over time. Now the time doesn't mean necessarily the time frame that we're animated in. It has nothing to do with that. It means that if I were to say, and this is exactly how Re Reaction Manager works, if I were to say for instance, at time 50 get me the value of the curve, I could then say get time 80 get me the value of the curve and I can get the value of that curve at any point in time again that can be over any time frame it could be a negative time frame it could be a negative value or whatever it is it's totally separated from the actual time that we're animating over and we'll see how in a second so we're going to use the curve I want to say assign controller again I want to say and go and pick that curve that we're inputting so this is our curve so the way we do this is we use an at time context. So we can say at time, the input time. So we're going to use this as our input time. And if we consider our input time here, this is our input time going across from zero to whatever or into negative values. So whatever the value is that this is returning is going to give us a point in time along our, our value line here. So we're going to say at time input time, and then we're going to say curve dot value. 
So we're going to go and get the value at that point in time. So what we've said now is at a given point in time, so the value of the height of the sphere essentially is going to input us a, a value across. We're going to go and get the value of the curve. So if I say eval now and take a look at what's happening, you can see that the box accelerates and then decelerates. You can see it doesn't get as high as you'd like. It doesn't go all the way up to the value. The box is much, much higher. You can see its value is actually 177. So this shows you can clamp it off exactly the same way too. So at 177, it's way down here somewhere and you know way off the end of the scale. So what we could do is we could say, okay, well let's let's make that work to the 177th frame so you can see that it actually is working in conjunction with it so now it goes up and hits the end come up and you can see now the box keeps going up with it now we can also add more values in here we could take it into a negative value if we wanted so I could uh, say add a key there and oops, I can move that key down. And let's give this uh, uh, fast in out. And then let's slow it back up into here. It's actually going to go past and back down again. So now you can see as this uh, the uh, sphere goes up, the sphere goes down, then comes back up again, goes over and shoots them back down again. So you can actually just hook it up. Going down, if we animate our sphere, I'll take the put it to frame 50, the last key, and maybe go to frame 100 now and take it back down again. You can see that it doesn't go down below because our value input is going to negative 270 at this point. So we would have to go to our curve and we'd have to do something the other way. So I could say, let's add another key into the negatives. And let's go in and actually push it back up again. So what is it, 270 some odd? And let's just set that as a tangent again. And let's do something like that. So you can see now what's going to happen is it's going to do what it did before and then go up and down and start going back up again. So this is exactly the way Reaction Manager works without Reaction Manager overhead. Now, if you've ever tried to work with global tracks, you'll note that as soon as you tried to merge the scene, what will happen is the React, the uh, uh, global tracks will be wiped out. This won't get merged in. So that can be a real problem. However, in this case, it can actually be very handy. And the reason it can be handy is, is that this controller here has been instanced and stored as a direct instance into the script controller. So let's actually replicate the idea of merging this in. First, I'm going to right click on the controller, highlight it, and I'm going to say make unique. So I break the connection between these curves and what's at the controller that's actually stored in the script controller. And then I'm just going to go in and remove them. And what you'll see is, is that it still exists and still actually is accessible. So it is possible through a little bit of Mac script to go and pull the value back out of the script controller, place it back into the global tracks to work with. Or, of course, I would just leave it in the global tracks you know, in a character. And when the character gets merged into scenes, it would automatically clear that data out for you. And you wouldn't have to worry about it. Nobody could actually go and mess with the curves. Well, I hope you enjoyed that. It's a solution to Reaction Manager um, without, uh, without Reaction Manager.